about the history of what we just did there, that ceremonial handshake? After all, it actually goes back quite a long ways, but we really don't think about it when we do it much, do we? We stick out our hand and we pump it up and down, touching a stranger. That's kind of funky, isn't it, when you think about it? <laughs> well, it actually goes back to about 70 BC. And evidence of it is in ancient Greek and Roman art. It shows men coming off of the battlefield, meeting for a truce at the center of a battlefield, and they would take off their armament, their long gloves, their protection, you know, to show there was nothing up their sleeve because those daggers and knives get in the way of a good truce. Now we have Facebook and fist bumps. And I don't know about you, and fist bumps could be quite hygienic, I suppose, and very hip and kind of fun, but that doesn't really scream, I come in peace, does it? This is all about the world of civility. And all of these conventions that we do to connect ourselves together a little bit is civility. They are protocols that we go through without thinking much about them, but maybe we will. Protocol means first glue. And that's the glue that comes to binds us together. It's a great word because it's, it talks about a bond, the beginning of a relationship. George Washington, our first president, actually had, was kind of hip to this subject when he was about 16 years old. What he did was he went through French manuscripts that were about etiquette and manners. He culled through them. They were written maybe 200 years before he was even born. He put them together into what was now known as the George Washington Rules of Civility. Now, some of those rules are kind of funny to us now because they don't make a lot of sense, like this one. Rule number nine, spit not into the fire, nor stoop low before it. Neither put your hands into the flames to warm them, nor set your feet upon the fire, especially if there be meat before it. <laughs> All right, so you, can you picture yourself getting to grandma's house for Thanksgiving, rushing past her, tearing off your muddy boots and your smelly socks and sticking your feet in the oven for the, to warm them against the turkey? I don't think so. But rule number 50, be not hasty to believe flying reports to the disparagement of any. Spreading gossip and believing gossip about anyone wasn't civil then and it's not civil now. All of his rules, really, when you boil them down, they come into this group of core values. Trust, respect, courtesy, dignity, honor, and my favorite, humility. I look at it as noticing the needs of others without needing to be noticed. It's kind of a tongue twister, and I'm actually glad I got that right. <laughs> About 100 years ago, I was a young staffer in the White House working for President Reagan, and we were walking to an event together. We got to the elevator, and he, being a gentleman, he says, after you. And I said, no, Mr. President, you know, I was working, and I said, no, no, after you. And he says, well, no, after you. <laughs> This went on for a little bit, and the Secret Service got a little nervous and said, Shelby, please just get in the elevator. <laughs> so I obliged. I didn't want to cause a national security issue. Far be it. But you know, it's, that's a simple little act, isn't it? Holding the door for someone or saying after you. But for him, it was how he treated everyone. He treated everybody with respect, no matter what their station. Not too long after that, he found himself in Geneva, Switzerland, talking to the then Secretary, General Secretary of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev. It was these two huge countries facing off against each other about nuclear proliferation and disarmament. Big stuff. Very shortly into their conversation, President Reagan decided that they needed to have a better rapport. He actually knew that from letters that they had passed back and forth that he might be able to work with this guy, unlike the predecessors. So he says to him, call me Ron. Pretty simple. You know, this is all big, heady stuff. Call me Ron. Let's go take a walk. So instead of facing off against each other at a table with all their staff next to them in these big power plays, instead of two heads of state, instead of two arched enemies, they were two men who were starting to the beginning of a friendship, and they would walk through the garden side by side, going in the same direction. Some might say that their warmth took care of itself later when they had this little problem at the negotiating table in Reykjavik, and they had to step away and take a deep breath. But because they had the basis of that relationship, they were able to come back together and accomplish great things. 
You might say that their warmth, the warmth of their relationship and their friendship, helped to end the Cold War. Now, does anybody think there might be a little lack of civility in our culture these days? I thought you might. I liken it to a quilt. It's kind of a lost art. And just like this woman's hands, you know, she delicately sews together the fabric, these patchwork pieces that make this beautiful piece of art. Think of our society that way. That the stitches of our society are those conventions, those handshakes, that rapport that we build one by one, inch by inch. And if we, if we don't take care of the quilt and make sure that those seams are tightly sewn, then it all falls apart. The fabric of our society can fall apart. And sometimes it feels like that's what's happening. We're more connected than ever. Does anybody recognize a scene like this? I know I do. <laughs> We're more connected and less, less emotionally connected. We yearn for, to be heard. We yearn to be respected and trusted and all those things that civility has on it. But what if we flipped it on its side? What if we flipped it upside down completely and said, how can I show respect? How can I earn trust? How can I help somebody be connected without needing any credit? Without asking anything in return? Let me tell you the story about Josh Yent. He was a student in Canada, and he stuttered his whole life. And he was bullied. He was a perfect target. You may have heard his story. It went viral not too long ago. But when he got into high school, he, I, this is my favorite part, he took control of his life. He didn't let himself be defined as a victim or a victim of bullying. He said, I'm going to turn the table on this. And he decided to do something that actually came very natural to him. He went to the front door of his high school, and he held the door the first morning of school, greeted absolutely everybody who came in. The next day, he did the same thing. The day after that, the same thing. And pretty soon, people started to look for him. Very soon after, they started to look for him and greet him. And it became this camaraderie, and he became named the doorman. They loved him. His school loved him. The community was affected by it. There was this great ripple on this great fabric of their society. And other people started doing random things, small acts of civility in their community. It became a happier and better place. You know, it may not be world peace that we can solve here right now. It isn't just about kings and queens and prime ministers and presidents, though. It's about you and me and Josh. And we can do the smallest of things to make a difference in somebody's life. Just think, maybe today, we can leave this place, we can hold the door for someone behind us, give them a wink, maybe, or a smile, and say, after you. Thank you.